pleased to be a guest on the legendary cult radio Agogo. Oh my goodness. Oh my god, the legendary Jack Hill. Shoot, it's, shoot, it's your nickel, as we used to say back in the 40s. <laughs> wow. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are so excited. We've been talking about this man for the past two hours. We are so excited to welcome the legendary director and writer, Mr. Jack Hill. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. All right. <laughs> and I understand you were on our website. Boy, that makes me all nervous now. Yeah, I'm on your well, I'm on your page here. I don't know. I'm just looking at this list. Oh, I'm making you all nervous. Let me see. Uh, I think I see something down here. Tiny Tim. Hmm. <laughs> Guy with the ukulele, I remember him. Yeah, okay. we're, we're a little bit, we're like you, Jack. We're a little bit different than, than most <laughs> other people that produce content. And, okay. and man, you certainly have. You know, I, I love what Tiffany told me. We want to talk about this first before we get into your legendary career. That it, it's very strange because where you come from, now you were from uh, parents that were involved in film, and I, I find it really crazy. Because when I, I first got to Hollywood, the first one I met was Samuel Z. Arkoff. And the thing that he was most proud of at the time is he was renting his office from the Walt Disney Company. And oh. I, yeah, I laughed because even he laughed. Sam Arkoff was laughing. He couldn't believe that somebody that had done films like he had done, and, and here he is associating with Disney's and Disney offices. Now I find out there's another man that was somebody that was involved in exploitation films, and your father had a connection with Disney, too. Yes, he designed the Disneyland Castle, actually, Sleeping Beauty's Castle, and uh, he designed the interiors from Captain Nemo's submarine and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, but uh, that was only in the last few Oh, no, I guess he worked for Disney for quite a while, actually, but uh, he was at Warner's from way back from when it was first national studio back in the 20s and uh, clear up until the consent degree dissolved uh, the studios in 1948. Wow. And then, he, uh, and then he went to various other studios after that, ended up with Disney, yeah. And we're talking about your father, the great Roland E. Hill, and uh, you have done something that I think more uh, people in your position should do, and that is pay homage to your parents because your your father certainly had an illustrious career in Hollywood. You put out a book on him. Yeah, well, I put out. Yes, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, because it just uh, went out on uh, Amazon Kindle and uh, some other. Uh, it's an ebook. We discovered quite a few years back, long after my mother passed away, it was uh, outlived my father by 20 years, and I didn't know that she had this uh, trunk in the garage that had. All of my dad's uh, memoirs uh, are pictures and letters and drawings, and mostly letters that he wrote very frequently from when he was a flyer in the First World War mm-hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and studied architecture in Paris in the 20s after that. And he, uh, he had his girlfriend, Kiki de Montparnasse, a very famous model, and... Um, so he's, it's very interesting. And then, uh, and then there's the stuff with Disney. So we put this all into, we uh, um, uh, scanned all these letters, mm-hmm. and uh, he illustrated his letters with drawings. So the book is called The Illustrated Letters of Orney Hill uh, from the Great War and Beyond. Wow. Oh, designer of the Disneyland Castle, yeah. And the thing that's great, too, is, is not only do you have your father's letters, but how did you get a hold of, supposedly uh, uh, you have unpublished, never-before-seen drawings by Pablo uh, Picasso and also Walt Disney. I mean, how did you get a hold of those for the book? Oh, well, he saved those. He saved those. He picked those up. The, the, uh, he knew Walt Disney. Walt Disney, when he was uh, 17, 18 years old, was a volunteer ambulance driver in France hmm? at, towards the end of the war. And uh, he knew my dad uh, from there. Wow. And uh, so when the time came... Many, many well, generations later, uh, Walt was looking for somebody to do some work for him, and uh, my dad went to work for for him. And uh, yeah, he's got several pictures from Man Ray and Pablo Picasso because he was uh, his girlfriend was Kiki de Montparnasse. Now you know who I'm talking about Kiki right. de Montparnasse, very right. famous model, the queen of Montparnasse, whose um, famous relationship was with photographer Man Ray. 
and uh, but he was going with her, and Man Ray photographed Picasso, so Picasso knew Man Ray, and if my dad knew Man Ray, he probably knew Picasso, and so he's got some drawings from Picasso and some from Man Ray and some other artists there. Wow. He saved. That's incredible so, um, to know that that stuff still exists. Wow. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, it existed in a trunk in my mother's garage for, for years and years and years. <laughs> we never knew what was in it, you know, until after she passed away. So then, uh, yeah, so we've uh, transcribed all the letters and put the drawings in. It has to be an e-book cause, because a lot of the drawings, most of the drawings are in color and the mm -hmm. pictures are in color, of course, and a lot of photographs that he made at the time. And uh, so... Uh, it would be horribly expensive to publish it as a paper book, so we no. do it as an e-book, and uh, anybody can pick it up on uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Now, being a set designer and, and having done stuff for Walt Disney, he worked on a bunch of other classic great films we know, including The Jazz Singer, uh, and and you know everybody knows that for sure as one of the first uh, sound films ever produced. Yeah, I, I believe he did. Yeah, I'm not. I don't really know much sure of all the titles he worked on. I had a list of them at one time. The Motion Picture Academy has, uh, has so yeah, he worked. Uh, yeah, the funny thing, I even mentioned this in the, in the book, is that he worked for, um, um, who, who's the German guy, uh, the German, great German director who directed, uh, uh, oh gosh, what's his name, Fun, Fun, Fun something or other, I don't know, Any, anyway, this famous German director, he was in uh, uh, Sunset Boulevard, mm -hmm. you know his name? Yes. Can you think of his name? Uh, let me think. I know who you I'm mean. I don't remember. Right. She's trying to look okay. it up as we're, as we're speaking here. Okay, yeah, I can't think of his name. Anyhow, anyhow he was a very famous silent movie director, and um, and my dad worked for him. And he, he just told me the story one time that he was such a sticker for realism, he wanted to make sure that there was an open toilet shown in the, in the, in the movie. He wanted to make sure that there was poop in there that you could see <laughs> spliced around. <laughs> But Sunset Boulevard, are you talking about the, the director? Are you talking about Billy Wilder? No, no, no. The guy, he, he acted in the picture. He played himself as the director. Mm. Von Stroheim. Von Stroheim. There you oh, go. Yes. There you Eric go. Von Eric Von Stroheim, yeah. yes. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, so that was very funny. So do you really have your interest in, in making films from what your dad had done? I mean, did your dad talk to you a lot about films when you were a boy, and is that what made you interested? No, not, no, not too much, actually. Well, actually, he, he, once in a while, he'd bring a script home for me to read so I could see how they were written. Uh -huh. And, uh, and I, he took me to the studio a couple of times, just when I was very little, and uh, uh, he took me to see what they were doing in a picture called Action in the North Atlantic. It was mm -hmm. a Humphrey Bogart war movie about the, the, uh, the North Atlantic War, and he showed me that they they had miniature submarines and miniature ships in a big outdoor tank, and they had midgets driving them. <laughs> That's my introduction to the magic of the movies, you might say. But no, I was uh, raised uh, to be a musician. My mother was a music teacher. I learned violin and piano, and then later took several other instruments and had uh, careers in various directions as a musician. But I went back to uh, school in UCLA to get my degree in music, and I took a minor in uh, cinema because I wanted to learn how to compose music for movies. Right. And uh, in fact, I did compose and, and record and conduct a score for a student film while I was there. But they encur I took a writing course, and they encouraged me to do more, and so I directed a couple of little short films. And then I got uh, a job working... Well, I was very good friends with Francis Coppola, right. and he got a, he got in with Roger Corman, and then he brought me in, and then uh, when Francis went on to bigger things, I did a few more pictures for Roger Corman. Well, your your music career, I, I mean, it says here in my notes, unless are wrong, that you played in a symphony orchestra that performed for the soundtracks of Dr. Zhivago and Brothers... Uh, Karam Karamsmov. Yeah, yeah, I played I played an instrument called the Hungarian cymbalum. Oh. It was kind of a Hungarian gypsy music instrument. You Very used cool. to see them in movies once in a while, and the composers liked that sound for that kind of music, I mean, for that kind of a movie. And so I did a lot of those things. I, when I hear the Dr. Zhivago music playing in the supermarket, I can hear myself tinkling away there on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> in a way, you're... 
it helped it helped me get get help get me through cinema school at UCLA. I can tell you that. Yeah. yeah. In a way, your your music career had another kind of crazy turn, and and maybe that was the beginnings of, of you seeing like what you might see in one of your exploitation films, because it, it certainly would give you an idea of doing so that you compose music for burlesque. Is that right? I wouldn't say composed music. I did arrangements for. Okay. Uh, there was a couple of a couple of guys uh, were. Um, uh, uh, well, yeah, I did actually write some original, but not not that much. Uh, yeah, that was uh, yeah rather short period of my so-called career at the time. But uh, yeah, Lenny Bruce. Yeah, well, anyway, I won't get into that. But uh, there was a couple of guys, uh, singers, who had an act, and they were they worked in uh, in. Uh, burlesque shows and so I kind of got into that doing arrangements for music right. and everything that was a very mercifully short period of my career such as it was <laughs> <laughs> it was a short period but it was kind of weird that it kind of went full circle because in getting to know uh, Lenny Bruce you actually turned around and casted his daughter Kitty Bruce in what would be one yeah. of the most iconic films Jezebels or aka Switchblade Sisters is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was. It was just uh, one of those coincidences. Right. So I know that hap happened to show up. Yeah. Go ahead. No. Well, go ahead. You can finish that story. No, no. That's uh, there's nothing more to say. She was. I don't remember how we uh, how we came across or how we met her, but I just liked her and uh, she fit in the picture. I thought very well. Right. So you were saying that you know in the beginning you were very good friends with uh, Francis Coppola, and of course he started working with Corman. So how did you end up getting kind of pulled into that and working with that? And I have to ask your opinion of Roger Corman, because, of course, in the world of uh, cult cinema and, and B-movies, Roger Corman is revered as, as being a genius. However, we've talked to a lot of people that have worked with him, and they've had varying opinions of him. So what was it like for you in the early days working with Corman? Uh, it's, you know, it's a difficult question for this, for this reason. Because there are so many things, uh, so many really horrible things about it. I, you know, when I worked with Boris Karloff, one of the things he said to me, oh, I asked him how he liked working for Roger Corman. He said, I don't want to hear that man's name spoken in my presence. So there's a certain side. <laughs> I, could, <laughs> I could understand that. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, it was an opportunity that practically nobody else would give you a chance to go out and shoot a movie. You know? yeah. And, uh, oh, I made... I made trailers and did all kinds of stuff uh, like that and fixed other people's pictures. Yeah, well, you probably know that I worked on uh, on um, Dementia 13, which right. Francis shot, shot and never finished, and uh, did a lot of work on getting that put together finally. And that's the kind of work, but it was great a great learning experience. Uh, uh, I know you worked with uh, Karloff later on in your career, but is, is it true that I, I read somewhere that you even wrote part of the terror is that right yes yeah that's right um th that's a really funny story it's not a real short story maybe i can make it if you're interested oh go ahead uh, and be as lengthy as you want yeah yeah Roger, Roger, <laughs> this, uh, as part of it is pretty well known roger had uh, sets built at aip uh for a movie that he made with uh, with boris uh, with boris there and uh, the sets were still standing over the weekend and he made a fast deal with boris for a certain amount of money to work two days, and he had uh, a script written, I guess he pulled it out of his trunk, uh, Leo Gordon, he was an actor, very well-known actor, and he had the script, uh, and so he shot all of the scenes with Boris in them on these sets and other, whatever uh, other things that were in the picture, and then uh, that was only a fraction of a movie, so then he hired Francis to write a script to well to rewrite Leo Gordon's script sort of um, to uh, expand it out into a movie and direct the scenes and so that's what we did and I worked with uh, Francis on doing various I was just working for Roger Corman and I worked a lot in the movie and doing various things recording sound and making inserts and stuff like that but then it turned out that uh, and then when Francis left Roger to work on major pictures uh, the picture kind of ended up in my lap, and it uh, made no sense because uh, there was whole sequences that were sh that were supposed to be set at night mm -hmm. and <laughs> shot exterior sequences day for night, 
and Francis neglected to tell the cameraman, <laughs> who, by the way, was my same guy, who, my cameraman on Spider Baby, uh -huh. uh, Al Taylor, yeah, neglected to tell him that this was supposed to be night. Wow. So the scenes were all shot for day. <laughs> said they had, they had to, they had, the scenes had to be intercut with interiors that yeah. were night. You couldn't, so it was completely unusable, and a lot of it didn't make sense anyway. So Roger turned it over to me to take, salvage what footage we could, and write a new script. So I wrote, a, uh, I wouldn't call it a new script, but I wrote, uh, <laughs> I wrote <laughs> everything necessary to put all these pieces together and a whole lot of new material. So I don't know uh, how you would. I don't. I don't know if that's ever been done before. Probably in the d silent days, it would no. common, <laughs> common work. But anyway, anyway, the picture actually turned out doing very well. Uh, probably very largely through the soundtrack by Ronnie Stein, who also recorded, also did the music for my Spider Baby. By yeah, the way, for sure. And then a little. Yeah, we <laughs> definitely talk about that and, and, and music to the point even was even Spider Baby, a musical was kind of homage to you, it's funny. But I want to ask you more about this. Uh, we uh, interviewed Dick Miller, God rest his soul, recently passed away. And, and he had talked to us about Boris Karloff. And, and with him, he was so in awe. I mean, Dick was professional and everything, but he couldn't believe he was with Boris Karloff which was a god to him. Now, you come off like Karloff was pretty personal with you. I, I mean, did were you kind of in awe of him at all? I know that, that you certainly must have grown up watching Boris Karloff films. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say it was in, in awe of him. I wouldn't say that. It was just a really, really pleasure to work with him. I did not really have a lot of time to spend with him because yeah. he was only there for, I think, four weeks and he was very eager to get back to his rose garden in England. Yeah. <laughs> so we couldn't <laughs> run over time. And, uh, but he was great. I mean, he, as you may, must know, he uh, had emphysema, yeah. and he knew that he did not have long to live, so he was very happy to make a little extra money right. uh, doing this. And he liked the scripts, and uh, was very... Uh, but uh, he... He had his oxygen tank on the set, and he would sit and he would breathe his oxygen. And when he had to do an action scene, which he had quite a, quite a few there, he got up and did his action, just great. And then he went back and put on his breathing apparatus again. All right. It was a great, great guy. Wow. Well, that definitely admire him for that. I can relate. <laughs> Believe me. No, I had heard that story that he would do a scene and literally kind of collapse back into his wheelchair. That it, you know yeah, that he. No, stood I wouldn't say he himself. collapsed, but, uh, but he would just you know he was resting himself, uh, his strength. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a great thing to start out working with Roger. It's a definite education. I don't imagine you made a lot of money, but you certainly learned a lot. I, I don't know what your official title was, Jack, but I guess it was kind of like the cleanup person because from what I understand when the wasp woman okay was uh, released to television didn't you have to I heard you had to film an additional 20 minutes you had no access yeah. to any actors what was that about yeah well I, I <laughs> well it, the, he, the movie was too short to, to be released <laughs> for TV it needed 20 more minutes so for it so I had to get uh, uh, let me see there was one actor who I, who was actually in the original movie that I uh, got back, and he was uh, kind of had to have him because he was really in there. Yeah. I don't remember all that much about it. I just remember that I wrote a whole new script to make to make sense of sort of before and after, and pad out the pad out the picture so it would be just long enough for TV. And uh, that's I can't say that's one of my happier times, but it was a job and another thing that you learn from. Well, everybody's talking nowadays uh, about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and I don't know if you've seen it or whatever, uh, Quentin Tarantino, uh -huh. and everybody loves him. And, of course, he's one of us. He really is one of us. And the reason that I know he's one of us is because he re-released in theaters uh, through his company uh, the Jezebel, the Switchblade Sister, because he said that you were, to him, the Howard Hawks of exploitation. How do you feel about that comment? Uh, yeah, well, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're so uh, humble, Jack. I mean, that's, uh, how, how can you not like a guy that talks like that? You know? right. He says, <laughs> coffee, he says, he says uh, coffee was the greatest uh, revenge movie ever made. How yeah. can you not like a guy who talks like that? But <laughs> it's, it's his way of talking. I can't give it too much, you know. I mean, I'm very happy to hear it, of course, but... Uh, 
I mean, comparing me to Howard Hawks, come on, give me a break. You know? <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of cool the way things have worked for you because you were kind of rediscovered, uh, you know, by Tarantino that re-released your film. And then that's kind of what happened with Spider Baby. Now, uh, the, the story goes is for a long time there was like really bad prints of Spider Baby circulating and it was due to a big film fan, from what I understand, that, that the restoration came about. Is that right? No, no, no. That's not, that's not quite the story. All I, right. uh, I had lost track of it. Uh, and then when home when home video uh, video cassettes came in, I discovered that there was somebody releasing the film on on video cassette, and I had no idea how they ever got it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it turned out that there was a company that had, uh, I guess they had they got a hold of a of a theatrical print, of which there were there were a few out there, and uh, had transferred it, and it was a horrible transfer, and so. I was so f furious over what had happened to it that I f said, I'm going to find some way to get this uh, back in my control and get a, a really good um, release on home video on it. And uh, so it's kind of a long story, but I knew, the, um, I knew where the negative was, the lab, and I knew that the people who were, I knew the name of the company. His name was, let me see, I can't remember his name right now. Um, but he was the, the distributor uh, who had originally distributed the movie. He had actually saved it mm. when it was cut up very badly by the producers who got into a panic and they went bankrupt. Um, and uh, the picture was just locked up for years. And he had acquired it for distribution after about four years or so and restored parts that had been cut. And so there was an actual print, there was an actual negative, and I knew that the negative... I knew where the negative was. It was in a lab, and um, but they would not grant anybody access, you see, because they don't know who owns things. Uh -huh. And so uh, I was trying. I was kind of stuck because there's no way that that lab would give me access to it to make a transfer, a digital transfer. But uh, the producer, I wish I could think of his name right now, Dave Hewitt. Dave Hewitt. Okay. He was a. He was he had a company that made movies like The Mighty Gorga. You ever hear that one? Yeah, David, David he made those kind of pictures. And he loved the movie, and he had distributed it originally. And uh, so I contacted him, and he gave me uh, the name. Oh, okay. Uh, in order to get access to a print that's in a vault, you have to be on an access list. Mm -hmm. And his company was on the access list because his company had distributed the picture. Okay. All right. So I knew him, and I knew where he was, and I called him, and he helped me. And I made up, uh, I made up a, uh, a fake uh, order, order form, you know, uh, what, what do you call it, an order when you order something. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and Go I... Go Jack. <laughs> you can invoice, yeah. yeah in, in, no, not an invoice, a... Uh, I forget what it's called. It's an order form where you order a transfer to be made. Right. And, and I, on the stationery with this company name on it. And I faxed that into him, and they called me back and set up a date for transferring it. So I went in, transferred it all in one session, grabbed it, paid cash, and got out before the, <laughs> before the officials at the lab found out what I had done, because they were, they were furious. <laughs> Good for you. I had it and there was nobody could take it away from me. So that was the origin of what was eventually a laser disc, and uh, dis distributed, and that was the origin. And now, now of course, the uh, Motion Picture Academy has the negative and has restored it and has made actual new prints. So it has a happy ending. It definitely does from from that crisis. Yeah. And I mean, it's so iconic. Uh, I, I mentioned iconic. I mentioned. That there was even a musical made. Uh, we actually had the producer on the show of Spider Baby the musical. Yeah. What did you? What did? Yeah. What did you think when that came out? I uh, well, yeah. I was uh, in, involved uh, a little bit there. He was uh, checking with me to see if I liked it. And I went to see the rehearsals and things like this. Uh -huh. I thought he did a pretty good job actually, uh, but um, just he didn't have the luck with him. I guess uh, I thought that it had a good chance of. Uh, of um, catching on somewhere, but it just 
didn't. Uh, I think one, if I can just say, my opinion was that he was he was a good musician himself on, on the guitar, but he didn't know how to write music, if you know what I mean, right. how to write notes on paper. Right. And uh, so I said, you know, you've got to have lead sheets, you've got to have music here that people can, can look at, and he, he just wouldn't do it. So I, I hired a guy myself that I knew who could t- who could play the recording and then transcribe it into notation. Right. So I got all those songs on notation, hoping that if he got a buyer there, I, I could I could show them the the song so they could actually. Yeah. Anyway, they, right. so that's that. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's great. I thought it was funny and amusing and really yeah, enjoyed it good. and. It kind of went full circle once again. Your movies and your music. I mean, it, it had music. It kind of combined all that. But I, yeah. I, I wanted to mention. I you know I I know Rob Zombie thinks he made Sid Haig famous, <laughs> but I have to disagree with that because I think you're the one that made Sid Haig famous. And I'm telling you, Sid Haig, we 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 know him. I've hung out with him. Oh. I've ate with him. Had him on a show. All the things that Sid Haig has done. I think the things he's most proud of is working with you, and I'm telling you the truth. Well, yeah, I I, I, I can under, understand that because I really gave him challenging things to do that gave him a chance to really show his stuff. Uh, yeah, well, um, that was uh, yeah, I had a great relationship with him. Well, I gave him his first. You know, he was in my student film at UCLA. You probably know that. You know, yeah, and I wanted to ask first. about that. You worked with him before Spider Babies in a student film. Yeah, yeah, student film called the host. It's actually available on the uh, seat on the DVD of uh, Switchblade Sisters. Ah, very cool. Well, I'll tell you, there's one other thing that, that Sid Haig mentioned. In, in as much as uh, being honored to be working with you, uh, the one picture he likes to sell, he tries to even talk people into buying it, and that's the one I would buy. Is, is he was so proud to work with and what was the last film role of the great Manton Moreland. Now, I've got to know, how was it that you thought of casting Manton Moreland? Were you perhaps a Charlie Chan fan, or how did that come about? Uh, no, uh, I just, uh, the, I had discussed it with the producers, and they liked, liked the idea, and uh, I wrote, so I wrote him into the script, and uh, it's, it's difficult to imagine now what the civil rights movement was like at yeah. that time actors black actors who had played especially comedians like an example is step and fetch it you know mm-hmm. who played these really demeaning roles and my, it was my idea to show the end of that uh, in, in, in my own funny way right. by having Mantan Moreland uh, a comedy character suddenly horribly murdered <laughs> which, <laughs> and Manton loved it. He had it. He had such a great time. I, but he was, you know, this the civil rights movement destroyed his career because he played. He was a comedian, and he said he didn't see anything wrong with playing scared, right. you know, and the other stuff that he did. That was not like step and fetch it. He was different. But he got lumped in with that kind of uh, the demeaning black portrayal you know and mm-hmm. it was that so he was so happy to be working and he had a great time doing it did, did anybody uh, on the set I mean were they aware of his uh, long career as a comedian and, and working like with Charlie Chan films and stuff or oh I'm sure they were yeah yeah that was yeah. you know that was back in the 60s he was still his movies were known yeah sure yeah everybody well, everybody there loved working with him that's definitely true what you said about how he was kind of a, a victim of civil rights at the time because I know I heard him make comments and he just wanted to work you know like a lot of them did and it was just too bad that a certain section you know would say oh what, why are you acting dumb and playing dumb because that, that was a harsh yeah. thing to go through but I'm, I'm really so much want to thank you for having him in that to see him one more time and then come to find out it was his last role I guess so yeah yeah well he was just basically nobody knew what to do with him I guess yeah, yeah. well you know you've discovered a lot of people and you discovered his <laughs> Sid Haig, if I can. <laughs> but I, I'm telling you, somebody else that you are definitely credited with, and another guest. We all these people. You must be a nice guy, Jack, because they all like you that worked with you. Uh, we had on Pam Greer, and yeah. Pam Greer really loves you so much. 
and and you were really instrumental in bringing her to the forefront which is the strangest thing I've ever heard of, and that is somebody named Jack Hill, a little white man, making these black exploitation films. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I, I wanted to make uh, a picture that if I was black, I would have got lynched. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that no black guy would dare to make, and it worked. Primo, uh -huh. as you probably know. Absolutely. And I got a lot of, yeah, I really cooperated a lot with, with Pam. Because I knew Pam very well. I mean, I had done, she had done the first picture that she had any real role in, you uh -huh. know, was the, uh, uh, the Big Dollhouse. Right. Which turned out to be a huge smash hit. And uh, and she stood out so well that, and she, I don't know if you, if you know this, but she actually, because she had this great voice, she recorded the, title song for the movie for the soundtrack yes yeah. long time woman yeah we play that yeah. on the station we play it on cold oh, radio did. Oh, I know, I know, yeah. Yeah. and and it caught on because like in places like i don't know places with uh, big black neighborhoods cities they they had uh, ripped it off and uh, were playing it on the on the radio stations and the black radio stations so i thought that was just really fun did you, did you have a certain idea i know you talked about being lynched or whatever but did you have a certain idea of how black people should be portrayed because it kind of goes back with the whole thing with with Manton Moreland this and that to where before women uh, in in films and that uh, in black films a lot of times they were hookers and prostitutes and drug addicts or whatever and you wound up making Pam Greer like the hero and the action star I mean was that something you thought that should have been done how'd that come about that you got that formula yeah well luckily enough uh, uh, the um the guy who was the head of production at AIP um, went along with me on that. Uh, let me see. I can't think of his name. Larry, Larry Gordon. Mm -hmm. He was the head of, head of the studio at that time. And uh, other people thought it was crazy. And he supported me and supported my screenplay uh, against these suits that always want to drag you down. Right. And uh, so I really got to give him uh, credit for that, for allowing me to do that. And, uh, and I got a lot of inspiration from Pam. She gave me ideas that I, I would never have had if I hadn't known her personally. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, in researching, you know, I, I know a lot about you and everything, but maybe I just didn't read the credits at the time. There was a movie <laughs> I, I saw, <laughs> <laughs> and I do read the credits too, but this is one time I might have missed it. There was a movie I saw that reminded so much of a Jack Hill movie that I swear to God, it was you, and I find out it wasn't you. And that is a movie Pam Grier, uh did called Black Mama, White Mama. Do you think they copied your style? Because I really do. Uh, yes and no. Uh, it was a kind of a remake of, um, uh, you must know the one, the one was, uh, uh, was a famous Hollywood movie about two guys, a black guy and, and a white guy, chained together. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it was... Uh, I can't remember the names, uh, the names of any of it, but anyhow, th the idea was to you, was to do that same gimmick with with women. And Pam, you know, I had sh Pam was uh, in 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 the Philippines. It was shot in the Philippines. She did several pictures in the Philippines right. because she just stayed there. And uh, Roger Corman and his co-producer there in the Philippines, who's passed away recently, I can't remember his name, uh, were doing several several other kind of similar pictures. And that was one of the better ones. Oh, uh, let me see. Who was the her co-star in that one? Was um, can't think of her name right now. She's uh, also a friend of mine. Her husband is uh, oddly enough. Let me see. Matt M Mark Mark Damon. Yes, he was a yeah. producer, and he also played as an actor in a Roger Corman movie back in the fifties. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was the uh, yeah, it was the uh, house uh, the. The one where the house burns up and the other Edgar Allan Poe movies. Uh. Oh, know, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's saying something for working with you to have Pam talk about what a great experience it was to know that work, working in the Philippines had to be hell. Uh, hey, well, let, let me put it this way. It, yeah, it was difficult because the things that that normally you'd expect to be difficult... Uh, that you would want to bring your own people for mm -hmm. would be like the cameraman, you know, this type of the high, the high, the higher end part of the cruise. But 
and you wouldn't even think about things like wardrobe. You know? right. But it turned out to be just the opposite. The cameramen were, and the crews were excellent. They just did really good work. Uh, the negative side of it is that nobody expected to start on time. Uh, Americans were considered weird because they started on time. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> kind of a different, you know, a different kind of uh, belt on showing there, if I can say so. And uh, but the, the the things that were bad were like the set dresser and the right. wardrobe, oh, and uh, this kind of things. So it's, it had a good. Uh, but the main thing that was good about it was that normally the most expensive item in a budget is time. The Philippines, that was the cheapest item in the budget, right, so you could sure. play around and do things and make stuff up and, and uh, you know, shoot things that weren't in the script, <laughs> which I did quite a bit of, yeah. So <laughs> well, that was funny. So that was hopefully funny, you're yeah. not dealing with any diseases that you wound up getting filming over there because that, that place is rough. But I've, I've got to mention, uh, going back to Spider Baby, as we talked about the uh, iconic Mansion Moreland, we certainly can't forget Lon Chaney Jr. was in that film too, and yeah, he had a great time. He had a great time, wonderful time doing it. Now I've, I've got to ask you only because of, of people that talk, and some things are true and some things are not. And, and you know, it, it was often said that Lon Chaney had a bit of a drinking problem. And I certainly respect him. Did you have any problems with Chaney on the set? No, no, not really, not at all. Uh, I didn't even know that he was. I thought he was on the wagon. I didn't even know until Sid Dag told me later that that orange that he would have in the middle afternoon was spiked with vodka. Uh huh. Well, he did good if it was spiked with vodka. <laughs> it was an yeah, I, no, he really, he really wanted. You know, he had been so abused. I mean, and so many shitty pictures just to get his name in there. And he really enjoyed this, and he thought that he thought that he did it for very little money because he really liked the script. And he loved the kids that he was working with. That's what I was going to yeah, say. That great the yeah. relationship on screen between him and the two girls, I mean, they really do come across as family. And, and I don't know if he looked at himself as, as a loving uncle, loving father, loving grandfather, whatever, but it really seemed like he really cared about those two actresses. Yeah, well, it, it, he did. I can tell you that for, for sure. It was... Uh, you know, the, I didn't really realize until later, but the key to the story was unconditional love. Right. right. That's yeah. for sure. The, the, the one scene that stands out in my mind that, that I think, there was only one scene in your movie that made me uncomfortable. <laughs> it, it wasn't any of the violence or anything. I could see that all day long. But uh -huh. where she's sitting in the guy's lap and kind of seducing him and knowing that she's so young, wow, that was a steamy scene. Can you, can you talk about the filming of that scene? I mean, were there a lot of giggles and stuff? Or? No, no, no. It was, uh, it, was, it was supposed to be playing for, for humor. You're talking yeah. about when she's sitting in the, in the guy in the, in the wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. Her, right? Yeah, yeah. No, she was just so good. This is the first movie she had ever done. And, uh, and we just took a chance on her because we are just so impressed with her personality. She just, and she turned out to be really good, really creative. She came to work with knowing every knowing her stuff and having worked out all of what she was going to do and it was pretty much just one take and that was perfect and uh matching her together with uh with uh, beverly washburn who had yeah. been a pro since she was a young child uh, they just played off of each other so beautifully and and lon just just really enjoyed it he just had a great time with it now the particular scene you're talking about yeah, that turned out to be very erotic, actually. It was yeah. supposed to have been funny. It, 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 bo <laughs> it bothered me. I mean, for one thing, she was so beautiful, and I was, wow, that was steamy. Yeah, she was only 17 years old. Yeah. It, it, the, the actor, the, the guy, was he nervous about doing that at all? No, I don't think so. No, he was a real pro, too. I can't, I don't know, he should have had a better uh, career. He was on a, uh, he was in a, uh, a soap for many years so he was a real real pro he knew his stuff and he just really loved the role he, he tried to do kind of a Cary Grant with it and it worked perfectly well maybe that's what kept him from being nervous and I know how to shit a brick <laughs> <laughs> for sure and it's, it's really too bad about the tragedy too when, when uh, the accident occurred and, and you know yeah the, I don't know well, she was she was uh, she was um Brando's lover at the time. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. 
he came incredible. to her funeral and stayed long after everybody else had gone and he once told somebody that that was the only woman he ever really really loved yeah. well there's another actress that you worked with I want to ask about because we know Pam Greer for exploitation films uh, and, and there's another one uh, that was pretty well known for doing those kinds of films uh, wound up doing a, a film called The Teacher with Jay North, uh, Dennis the Menace of all things. That was the only other movie that made me uncomfortable seeing Jay North in the love scene. But we're talking about Angel Tompkins. What was she like to work with? Angel Tompkins? Oh, yeah, I didn't really... I really can't say it really, really worked worked with her. That was a Mexican picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, the contract that I had was I wrote the script and uh, I was supposed to... The contract was I was supposed to go to Mexico to direct the picture. And... Uh, it was just uh, I had to, I had to leave because I couldn't couldn't uh, the producer was uh, I was not getting <laughs> calls. Yeah. He didn't. It uh, actually the Mexican Union the Mexican union, union unions would not have allowed me to to uh, to direct the picture. The producer knew that he just wanted to get a deal on me so, because uh, he got the scripts for a lot less because I had the contract to, to direct the picture. So I didn't really I didn't really direct any of it, actually. Right. Well, you know, we, we yeah. mentioned uh, the tragedy of one of the actresses in, in Spider-Baby, and there's another actress that I love so much, and she wound up passing away, and that's Cheryl Smith, a.k.a. Rainbow Smith. He worked with her in yeah. Swinging Cheerleaders. Was she a sweet girl to work with? I just had a feeling she oh, was. Oh, wonderful. She was just terrific. Just good. She, I, I think she had no idea of the radiance, the sexuality that she radiated, you know. Yeah. I think she didn't know that at all. She was just innocent of it. Now, that was really kind of fun. At least that's the impression I always I always had. Right. My, my I know other, other, other directors uh, that I knew really liked working with her, really wanted to, to use her, too. She was, other directors really liked working with her. I, I think it, your film, The Swinging Cheerleaders, I think it really was kind of like the Bible or the guidebook to all other movies that would <laughs> follow. It's like, you know, with the black quotation with, with coffee and that, I mean, you seem to be a trailblazer in that way. But uh, my one of my daughter's favorite scenes, my daughter is the one that sat next to me, it's the other host here, is, uh, you want to tell Jack your favorite scene? Uh, well, it's the line that uh, Roseanne gives. She's like, I ought to carve my name in that titty. I don't know why. It makes me laugh every time, every time I see it. <laughs> what, that? what scene? Where uh, what? the character of Lisa, played by Roseanne, uh, she's she's looking at the other girl. And she goes, "I ought to carve my name in that titty." Oh, you're talking about swinging cheerleaders? Yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Now I remember that one. <laughs> Sorry. Was that was that a line that was ad libbed, or was that something that was scripted, or? I don't remember that being in. There. Let me see. Carve my name. No, I don't really remember that. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, the we can't close this interview as we're getting near the end. We cannot close this interview without mentioning Switchblade Sisters, of course, it was Tarantino's, one of his favorite films. That's why he uh, released it to the world. <coughs> uh, you, you worked with uh, some very interesting actresses, one of which, <laughs> you talk about crazy history, Janice Carmen, uh, we had her husband on, uh, who uh, was Ross Bagdasarian, son of the Chipmunks, and she invented the Chipettes. So what was it like working with Janice Carmen? I bet she never thought she'd wind up being involved with the Chipmunks like that. I don't know. I know. She was just another one uh, of our cast members. She was just really good at what she did and uh, a pleasure to work with. I didn't really have a lot of, uh, of uh, connection with her personally at all. Uh -huh. She was just you know, another cast member. I, I think the, the the one that really stands out for me in that movie that, that I've got the biggest crush on, if I can just admit a crush, is is Robbie Lee. I, I think she had such a very unique voice, and 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 fit in real well. And and being the sweet as she is, to have to play that tough, do you think that was hard for her? Well, I, I saw her as, as a female James Cagney. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it. That's perfect. Female yeah, James. That's, Cagney. that's the way I saw it. <laughs> Definitely fit. Well, of all the yeah. films that you've made, I gotta ask the, you the movie that Terry that I cannot let Terry forget to ask is some a movie that he just rescreened. Oh yes, couple, I don't want to forget this. A couple of weeks ago, and that is a movie you did by the name of Mondo Keyhole. Oh God, don't don't bring that one up. Well, it was some, <laughs> I did some good things. It was not all mine. I had, was working for a guy who who was um, uh, in the business of making softcore porno 
stuff, including nudist films and things like that, and I did a lot of camera work. And so it was an opportunity for me because this is after I had made, uh, after I had made, uh, shot uh, uh, Spider Baby, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, couldn't, it wasn't released, and so I was really kind of down on anything I could do to make movies. So, so, so it gave me a chance to do a lot of, because it was, the, the whole thing they were selling there was the sex, gave me a chance to do some kind of experimental things that I really had a lot of fun with, but I never expected to, after 50 years, anybody would be talking about it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's now being screened on the night flight video service, but it, it, I like the look of it because, it I don't know, it just had that raw kind of super 8 millimeter kind of look. I mean, was it shot on 16 or... No, I shot in 35 millimeter. Yeah, oh, okay. I shot a lot of it with an IMO. You know what that is? Ah, uh, no. At the IMO was a 35 millimeter camera that you handheld 35 oh, okay. 50 foot rolls that the military used. Uh, uh, and when when they uh, the uh, Signal Corps people would take it with them and make films right. when they landed the D-Day oh, and things sure. like that. And so I could uh, conceal it. Well, I, that's a long story. Anyway, it was gave me a chance to do stuff that you wouldn't normally be able to do. I know a lot of the films of the day, like like Ed Wood would work that way, and a lot of them, uh, uh, Ray Dennis Steckler and stuff, would cast strippers that were already performing in clubs and that. Was that how you cast your film? Or? No, the guy I was working with, the producer, uh, John Lamb, these were all people that he knew. Now, I, I wanted to ask you, Jack, because we've had, you know, we've had directors and writers and actors on from, from different genres and things like that. Um, but how do you feel about the fact that you are so well known, and I, I, I don't want to say typecast, but you are so well known and ingrained for having worked in independent film, cult film, B movies. How do you feel kind of about that moniker? Because I know we've talked to some people that are like, hey, I love it. I live it. It's great. And others like, well, you know, I really wish I had worked for, you know, the big budget films only and not gone into the B-movie side of things. Well, yes, uh, you use the expression typecast. Yeah, directors get typecast. And uh, that's the, the, the more successful you are, the certain genre, you, the more you're typecast with that genre. And uh, my big hits there was, was Coffee and, and Foxy Brown. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, I was the guy who made black pictures, and they sneered at that. You know, oh, it's a black picture. It doesn't count, you know, even though, it, uh, even though uh, Coffee and Foxy Brown, uh, to my pride, were very instrumental in because they appealed so much to a white audience right. as well. They called it a crossover audience. Right. That it really was instrumental in bringing... Uh, showing producers that audiences, white audiences, were interested in black characters and lifestyles and would like to see them on the screen. And so it, uh, the, the movement really began then that you find black uh, characters and lifestyles incorporated into mainstream movies. So in that sense, I feel kind of proud that I contributed in some way to that. Did you ever show up at a screening in a black theater and have... Oh, yeah. Yeah, have yeah, it be yeah, a little surprise? Scary. Yeah, it was scary. It was scary. <laughs> I kinda, yeah, I almost envision uh, like the Blues Brothers when they had to play before a country and western <laughs> crowd. That you're in a black theater in front of a black crowd, and then th this white guy walks out. It, th that was very uh, brave. No, no, no. It was. It wasn't that there was no other white uh, people in, in the audience, but like uh, coffee would open in the in a theater in Pasadena, in the black neighborhood in Pasadena, and I and I went, and uh, actually the one of the actors, uh, Booker Bradshaw, who Best way uh, was was with me, and uh, it was so scary because the audience. I mean, talk about you know what what do the Greeks say? Uh, what's the word for it when the audience really gets involved? Anyway, the audience would get so involved they'd stand up and yell back at the screen, "Kill him! Kill him!" You yeah. know, this kind of stuff. And that was a little scary, but that's catharsis. That's the word I'm looking for, right. uh, in my humble opinion. Well, <laughs> but, you know, you, you have to worry about too. There's a, a certain group of the black population that would be kind of pissed off that a white guy was making their film because a lot of them don't think that a white guy understands uh, the black man and their trials and tribulations. I know Damon Wilson who played Lamont was on the show and he was all mad that the people that produced Sanford and Son were all Jewish and, and he was uh, like they don't know the black experience. Did you ever get any of that flack? 
No, no, no. In fact, many, many years later, when uh, on, on a number of occasions when I was invited to a uh, um, function with uh, where, where a lot of uh, black people, and I was introduced as the director of those films, and I got tremendous applause, and I <laughs> didn't good. feel that at all. And uh, because I'm a kind of an honorary brother, I guess. <laughs> you are. You are. Well, and and yeah. the other thing is, is that, I, I mean, I don't know about some of the other actors that was in the films like Antonio Fargus or things like that. But knowing Pam, I would think that if something was written into the script of Foxy Brown or Coffee or any of the other ones that was so incredibly wrong, I have a feeling she would have told you. Did that ever happen? Who would have told me? What? That uh, Pam Greer. She would have been like, N- now, Jack, this is not really how it would go. Oh no 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 because I I really uh, I really work closely with her uh, to to get certain things just right. right and I don't know I just see I was a musician you know and in those days when black people and white people didn't didn't uh, mingle much musicians were different and uh, when I was in high school when I was in high school Hollywood High School was Lily White there wasn't a black kid in the whole school and I was in the music department. And one day there's a black kid named Ernie, and I remember this so vividly, and he was a flute, played the flute, and we were all friends, and the head of the music department said, we've got to get that crow out of here. Mm. Uh, We've all had those experiences. That's what it was like. But being a musician, I hung out with, I I went to the places where musicians would go with the black musicians, and I I was, you know, I always had a... uh, I guess kind of a more of a closer feeling towards uh, young black people than, than anybody would have expected in those days. Well, you've done a lot of things and you've blazed a lot of trails, but if you look at your IMD, uh, IMDb, even though they definitely are iconic, legendary films that goes down in history, your list compared to a lot of directors, you really haven't done a staggering amount. I think, was there 19 credits or something uh, like that? 19 directing, 21 writing. Okay, 21 writing, 19 directing. Yeah. Why haven't you done more, and, and are you ever going to do a film again? Because we certainly hope so. No, no, I'm writing now. Well, I'll tell you what happens. Uh, this has to do, I'll go back to getting stereotyped. Uh, uh, after, uh, after I had these black exploitation pictures from AIP, uh, went, I was called to another producer that I knew, uh, and uh, they were interested in making a black film also because they were making so much money. Uh-huh. And these guys, uh, I hope you don't mind my saying this, but they were Jewish producers, mm-hmm. uh, who do you think would have some understanding and sympathy for ethnic stereotyping? Right. And they said, talking about the audience, what do they like? I know they like to laugh. And mm-hmm. I know the picture shouldn't be too good. Wow. That's what they said about about black films. I did not work with them. Yeah. Right, yeah. But that's stereotype, you know. Oh, he makes black pictures. You know, uh-huh. that doesn't count because anybody can make a picture for a black picture that would be successful, which, of course, you know, was, was not no, true. No. Yeah. Coffee, coffee opened, opened uh, uh, in, in the box office it opened about I don't know first week six or six or seven something like that, and the second week it was number one in the box office yeah. because of word of mouth. So that's one thing I like to recall. But anyway, I'm giving you an example of the stereotyping. Yeah, he makes black pictures. Right. Uh, well, you you certainly you certainly were were copied because once you did uh, the Pam Greer movies, a lot of people started doing what you did, and, and I guess oh, yeah. there was a situation even back in history. To where uh, you did a short film called The Host, and, and did you not feel there was a big section of Apocalypse Now that was pretty much copying? That's my UCLA student film. It's, yeah. it's available on the on the DVD for uh, Swiss Blade Sisters. You can look at it if you want to. Yeah, and I'll tell you something else funny about that. Uh, yeah, uh, the camera um, cameraman, Stephen Burem, who was one of the top cameramen in the business uh, in later years, he was my cameraman on that, and he was the uh, second unit cameraman on Apocalypse Now. Uh-huh. And I ran into him one time at the director's guild, and he said they were all laughing about him. they were making Jack Hill student film. And I'll tell you something else funny, but this is sure. that I don't have a lot of time. Uh, the my picture called uh, the Big Bird Cage. Right. Uh-huh. There's a beautiful set in a beautiful location, and you come up the river, 
and there's this fork in the river and there's this beautiful all these beautiful palm trees and everything and so that's where we shot the same identical place that which Francis used for Apocalypse Now wow <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, we've often little, found... A little trivia here for you. Yeah. you, you got to be careful because, you know, Hollywood steals a little bit or copies. I guess they say it's an homage. Man, we've had people talking about film ideas on a show and then all of a sudden it gets made by somebody else. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. how did that happen? It, it, it's crazy. Well, I don't know if you know this, but coffee was stolen. The idea was stolen and remade as a white picture. And I didn't even know it at the time because <laughs> it was AIP did it too. Yeah. One of the one of the people who was on the production staff at AIP took the took the idea and had somebody write it up as a white picture, and it was just a terrible flop, oh. which anybody should have been able to predict. Wow. It wouldn't work as a white picture. Come on, right. they don't get it. Now, they don't get it. Now yeah, decades okay. decades later, and and it, it, he had obviously said he, had, he did press saying that it was an homage but decades later as an homage to Foxy Brown Tarantino came out with Jackie Brown now did he talk to you about this or like ask oh, yes, your permission yes, he, told me, he, he told me that he named uh, Jackie after me and Brown after Foxy Brown because we got the name of the character very nice I was, I was going to say I hope, he, I hope he got your blessing Jack Oh yeah, <laughs> sure. What do, what do you think? Well, you know, like you it. work with great people, and Pam had a great sense of humor. We had her on the show, and I was talking about a scene that she had sex with Sid Haig, and we had Sid Haig on the show before, and Sid Haig was like, "Well, you know, she was underage when she did that scene," and I, I mentioned it to Pam Greer, and Pam goes, "I wasn't underage. He just wished I was underage." <laughs> So, <laughs> oh, that's very funny. So you work with great people that had a good sense of humor, and, and you just don't find those kind of people anymore, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I relied very much on, on actors coming up with ideas that when they had good ideas, and uh, actors like it very much when their ideas get accepted by the director, who otherwise might be too much of an ego trip to take somebody else's idea. Right. I found some of the... Some of the best moments were uh, ideas that the actors came up with. Well, Absolutely. well, I wanted to remind all of our listeners and, uh, about your book again that that just came out. Now, uh, the book is called Illustrated Letters of Roland E. Hill. Now, it just came out April of 2019. It's 320 pages. Uh, it's an ebook available on Amazon. Are you going to be working on other books, Jack? Is is this kind of like the next? Well, I, I interrupted work on a novel uh, to uh, to do this, having discovered these letters, and I'm getting back onto it now. And uh, the first of what I hope will be a series, uh, God willing, and uh, we'll see. Perfect, perfect. Well, again, the book is called Illustrated Letters of Roland E. Hill. Um, beautiful, beautiful book, 320 pages, unseen photographs, very interesting stuff. And, and very interesting and historical because I had no idea that your dad had such a career and such a history, which only lends itself along with your mom being a musician to why we have such a talented man in Jack Hill. Yeah, and you uh, know, I, I agree with you about being typecasted as a, a black exploitation maker, but you're so much more because you had young girlhoods and switchblade sisters. You had girl murderesses and, and spider baby. <laughs> and there's so many more films in this and that. I mean, you're known for so many genres. But I guess they really do typecast you as, as the black flotation guy. Well, yeah, somebody who makes that kind of movies. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I didn't want to make those kind of films anymore, but nobody would really take me seriously to make the films that I kind of re really wanted to make, so yeah. I just basically got out of it. Well, it's, it's been an honor to have you on, Jack. Like I said, it's an early birthday present Thank for us. You. We're trying to get Monica Gale to come on, and, and she's a little nervous, doesn't want to do radio. She only wants to do a magazine interview. But now that uh, the father of Switchblade Sisters came on the show, <laughs> and by the way, well, I you, know, well, you know, when I was uh, working on uh, uh, getting that distributed with Quentin, Quentin Tarantino, well, they tried everything to find Monica Gale. And uh, she was not, couldn't find her at all. It's amazing. How did you find her? Uh, well, if you want, I, w I will send you her phone number because I, I think. I have no, that's a, no, that's a little late for that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it, good. it took. No, but we really tried to find her. It and, uh, took about yeah. three to six months to track her down, and then I've been corresponding with her since then, but she's 
very reticent. But the thing that's interesting is that she doesn't think that she's hard to find. And when I spoke right. with her, she's like, well, yeah. I was like, I was like honestly, because I had seen there was literally forums and forums and forums of fans of Switchblade Sisters online who were talking about whatever happened to Monica Gale. Where is she? Nobody knew where she was. And I told her that. She's like, well, I don't understand. Like, I'm still working. Like, why is it hard for people to find me? And I was like, okay, well, nobody could. So. Well, she, she was almost <laughs> on, on the witness protection program. It was hard <laughs> to find her. But, but we did, and we've been talking to her on the phone. We're just trying to get her to come on the show. She wants to do a magazine oh. article, but she don't know about the radio thing. And I understand that. I mean, it's hard to do live radio, you know. But, but yeah. yeah, she's definitely... I, I, I think she reminds me a lot of uh, Rainbow Smith, you know? She does a lot, mm. maybe. I don't know. I don't know what she does to you. But, <laughs> well, but it, 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 uh, Quentin, Quentin Tarantino uh, remarked about it that because the Switchblade sister was kind of based on, uh, on um, uh, Iago, you know, on... Uh, uh, well, what's the play with Iago and... Uh, Oh, Aladdin? No, no. The oh, you said Yago. Uh, uh, the character of Yago. Um, oh, oh, come on, come on. It's one of the most famous Shakespeare plays about the black guy who was... Uh, who was uh, I see, I'm not into Shakespeare. Uh, so are you I talking about Othello? I can't think of the name. Of, yeah, Othello, Othello, yeah. The, yeah. the, the uh-huh. plot was kind of based on, on Othello, and he uh-huh. said she was the greatest Iago ever played on the screen. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Wow. You have to know your Shakespeare to understand okay. what he's talking about. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it's cool that you're writing, but you know, it would be cool if Quentin used you in like a cameo of some kind. If you got cast in like a little cameo role doing something, what kind of a role would you like to play? Oh, role I like to play? Yeah. Oh, I've done I've done a few and uh, pictures that, uh, that uh, just for people that I knew who were making a movie and wanted me to do a scene, and uh-huh. uh, I do those occasionally. I have done them occasionally, not for quite some time. I'm not really interested in doing anything like that anymore, uh-huh. to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, we appreciate you joining us. Again, yes. our listeners, please check out Jack's book. Again, it's called Illustrated Letters of Roland E. Hill. Um, he's the de- designer of the Disneyland Castle from the Great War and beyond. You can get the book on Amazon. Uh, 320 pages. Came out April of 2019. Jack, thank you so much for spending so much time with us tonight and uh, reminiscing and talking about your career. Well, thanks you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. And I hope Disneyland lets you in for free because your dad <laughs> designed the castle. I mean, good Lord. You should I don't to- think so. He was, uh, I put this in the book, actually. He was really, really unhappy with what they did with, uh, with, the, other, with the other Disneylands. Mm-hmm. Uh, Walt Disney was, uh, did not ever want to have any other Disneyland, but you know, as you know, he died really, really young. Yeah. And mm-hmm. these people opened the Disneyland in Florida, and right. my, when my father saw that what they had done to the design of the castle, yeah. his words were not polite. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know for a fact from knowing somebody that worked there because of hurricanes, I guess it's also designed to take apart if they have to really quick. So they probably did a lot of changes in the castle itself for, for sure. Yeah. Well, they just dressed it all up. And gaudy, and as before, it had this, it, this nice kind of simplicity to it. Yeah. it it's not okay. just a gateway, uh, Jack. It's a damn gift shop, which is yeah, a shame. That you know, too. it really is. But you know, that's that's commerce. That's the way it is. <laughs> yeah. And, and along yeah. with your dad, I'm sure Walt Disney himself is rolling in his grave too. Yeah. Because it, yeah. uh, he would know. not have been happy. No. no. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank <laughs> you so this much. Was really, his pet project. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, All Jack. Right. Have Anytime. a great rest of your weekend. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.